Chris is up next. Chris Heilman. There he is. <laughs> Chris usually goes first at Half Stack, but this year, I didn't want it to always be the same. So Chris decided we'd go in the afternoon this time. Yeah, well, that's the mystery. When, when are you talking? Sometime between 12 and 6. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, if you all don't know Chris, Chris has spoken at Half Stack many times in many countries. Chris lives in Germany now. He Brexited. And um, let's see, he's worked for Microsoft, Mozilla, Yahoo. Um, I met him and worked at Yahoo back in the days of like Dojo and jQuery and Prototype and conferences called Ajax something, like Ajax World and Ajax Experience. That's a clue for a pub quiz question later on. And well, we were on a panel, what, like maybe 15, maybe close to, well, like at least 15 years ago, maybe longer, where we first met and realized that two gingers in a room was not too many. We could peacefully coexist. <laughs> Just two fabulous paranormal people. <laughs> this one's a little, that dong is a little finicky, so you might want to scrunch it to make sure it's connected all the way. There you go. Nice design. Why are you doing this? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I have decided to outsource all the work to the speakers, I guess. <laughs> awesome. Well, without further ado, I've been saying that a lot. Give it up for Chris. Woo! All right. Uh, I'm going to talk about cheat codes for the web. That's something I've been working on uh, on the side. My main job is to be a principal program manager at Microsoft. I'm working on the developer tools in the Edge browser, which is shared together with Chrome and every other Chromium browser out there. So I'm working with Google, and I'm getting about 700 emails a day about people being confused why there are developer tools in the browser and why their website is being hacked by random people because there's a console showing up without them knowing why there's a console showing up. So I want to go back, a, bit, a bit back about uh, how I came to be what I am right now, how I am the developer that I am right now. Well, my parents loved each other very much, and no, not that far. Um, anyone knows what that is? That is the beginning of my programming career. Now, as a kid, I wanted very hard to get my first computer, and it all kicked off with the Commodore 64. This is one that's still running in Poland somewhere in a garage, and they're still using it for something. It had 64K of memory, it had one megahertz, almost one megahertz processor, and it had floppy disks and data sets before that, and so on and so forth. I uh, did a paper round, I did some certain jobs to get the money, I convinced my parents that I needed a computer to do my homework and to do all the all the things that we do in the household are much better with a computer. And of course, what I did with it was play games. But I sucked at them. I was really bad at playing games. And you can see, like, I had to diagonally jump over that. And the joystick didn't work for me. So I was really bad at playing games. And that all changed when the action replay came out. That is what that is. It actually allowed you to go back in the computer and press a button and make a snapshot of the whole memory into a chip on that one and then mess around with it. You also see that back then, advertising in magazines had a bit more text on it than it has right now. So the action replay cartridge allowed you to pause the computer and inspect a copy of the whole memory. And it had a feature called the poke finder. This is not a dating site, but... <laughs> Back then, we have shared basic, and basic, the poke command was putting a value in a place in the memory. The peak command was reading the value from that part of the memory. So to set a single byte, you use the poke, com poke command, and you read a single byte, you read the peak command. You also were able to do backups and do pirated copies of the games with the thing, but I never know anybody who did that. We all did that. So what it allowed to do is actually play the game and freeze it and say, how many lives do you have right now? 
three lives, and then you went back to play the game. It scanned the memory for a, for a counter where that three is, and every time you lost the game, it changed, it saw the change, and in the end, it ended up with one poke that basically would give you endless lives, and you were invincible, and you actually could play the game without actually being embarrassed in front of other people because the three lives that you lost. Of course, the thing is that sooner or later, the game producers also realized that that things exist and then actually wrote the games differently. So instead of just having a three in memory, they had a 14 in memory and counted that one down. Or they had like 10 lives or, uh, and you couldn't freeze as often and die as often, so it, this didn't work any longer. So by the way, uh, this guy actually in the, in the James Bond Goldeneye movie here is a Scottish actor by the name of Alan Cumming, who did a, a wonderfully racist Russian accent in that movie. And he also played Nightcrawler in the X-Men movie where he did a wonderfully racist German accent. So he's a good actor with kind of typecasting to some reason. But I love that character, that hacker character. And then things got more interesting when I learned about the monitor, which is like disassembling and writing assembly language and actually finding out how I can get endless lives. Because I realized one thing, that the counter thing is one bit, but then when the games got cleverer and basically got more counters and these kind of things, I realized any change on the screen, like one of these game characters going away, is something that I can monitor and I can then trace back to why it was deleted, and that way I was able to give myself endless lives. I could also look at the counter and see if, this, if the seconds count down and give myself endless time. And out of a sudden, where people came up to me and was like, oh, I suck at that game, can you do something about that? Magazines also printed those poke and peek things that you can actually, you got money for, if the, if the, like Zap and these magazines. So I actually made some extra money doing that. But the monitor bit is when I started to become a programmer because I looked at other people's assembly code and later on I wrote my own games by learning from other people what they have been doing. And let's all be honest, that's what we do as developers every single day on Stack Overflow as well. So what this taught me was that anything that is on a screen can be manipulated and looking under the hood is a great way to learn how things work. Other people go to university, read books. I basically messed around with things and tried to get into bits where I'm not supposed to be in and then learn how people did that and then copied it myself and made my own writing. I can safely say I've done JavaScript five, six years well paid before I understood it because I learned understanding JavaScript when I wrote my first book because then you can't fake it anymore. You basically have to explain it. On the web, this kind of access to content was called view source, and that's still something we have. That was the greatest thing about the web that I found. Before that, I looked at like Visual Studio, uh, no Visual Studio, Visual Basic, and uh, Ball and C++ Builder and stuff like that. On the web, I absolutely adored, what the fuck? <laughs> I, I absolutely adored that I can look at anything and mess around with it and find out how it works. And this is something that's the best way of like learning because I'm not supposed to go there. I'm not supposed to know it, so it felt dirty and interesting to learn it rather than just reading a book. Later on, we got the uh, thing called Firebug, which kicked it all off because the view source wasn't enough any longer. The view source is just the HTML that's rendered by the server. The uh, Firebug gave us the DOM access. So if, if you manipulated things with JavaScript, you generated things with JavaScript, you could see it with Firebug as well. And if you fast forward to now, we all have action replays on the web by pressing F12. And these are the developer tools in the browser. They confuse normal people. For developers, they're actually great. The only problem I have with them is that they've been growing spontaneously for 10 years. We added more and more tools in there, specialist tools that don't, people don't understand. And we, we tried something new with that focus mode that you might not have seen yet, where you actually have like the different tools according to a task rather than just all the tools at the same time. But people are still rather confused about them. And these are obviously developer tools because the interface is horrible and nothing's explained. So these are not designer tools, these are developer tools. So I'm gonna explain very, very basic things right now that may come across as condescending. Condescending is when you explain things in a simple manner in case you don't know what that is. And the developers among you will have kind of this reaction. This is nothing new, I know this, why do you explain that again? And I think it's important that we ourselves understand that this is grand that we know these things, but a lot more people can benefit 
from understanding that they have this action replay on their computer. That anything that is done to them on the web that's horrible and interrupting their flow can be undone by them using these developer tools. And I think us as developers, it's a good opportunity to tell people the power that they have and that's, that, that something popping up is not that they're being hacked, but they press the wrong button kind of thing. Anyone can use developer tools to get better at playing with the web. And the first thing that people do instead is download extensions. You just basically look for image downloader extensions. You get about 5,000 of them, about 4,600 of them full of malware and like random things in the background, and all of them pretty horrible and outdated and maybe full of ads. Now, we had a talk earlier about extensions, and uh, we, we, it was really interesting to see, and it was great, explained, well done as well. Uh, we also documented how to extend the developer tools lately, which was something that wasn't documented for like 15 years. But my problem with extensions is that they're actually far too powerful. Extensions in the browser give you functionality that the browser should have. We actually put features in the browser that are inspired by extensions. But an extension actually have, has far too much power because they run all the time and on every domain. The amount of feedback that I get that the browser is slow and then I look at what people have and they got like 50 different competing ad blockers running and, compl and wonder why this, the web is slow. It's not the browser, it's actually your extensions trying to intercept everything that you do on the web. Extensions have, you have no insight what else they do. You just basically have the extension, you got a nice icon, but if it in the download, in the background sends all the data to some horrid company, or if it in the background reads out all your cookies and sends them somewhere else, you have no idea. You can debug that with developer tools as well, but that's like another level of debugging that most people don't do. And they often slow down the browser because they're actually running in memory all the time, doing lot, all kind of conversion and things in the background. The other thing is that uh, now Chrome is moving to Manifest 3.3 and all the other browsers based on Chromium as well. So that will break a lot of the extensions that are out there on the web right now. Ad blockers mostly, that's the, that's the big, con the big discussions with Google and others. But I think this is coming and it's something that we have to understand. And most of these tasks that people do are not necessary to have an extension for because the developer tools can do them. Another thing that I'm going to explain now that I want you to explain to other people as well is that if they use these developer tools, nothing they do is illegal. Nothing you ins what they inspect is they inspect and change a local copy of the web project that they're looking at. They're not changing facebook.com, they're changing just what's on their computer at that moment at that time. Nothing they do is reported back to Facebook. They cannot trace if you're doing something in developer tools on your machine. A lot of people are worried about that as well. I wonder why. Nothing you do can break the sites you mess with. You just break your current experience on your machine. Nothing gets written back to the web unless they've done something really stupid, but I think it's almost impossible to do something like that. In a network tool, you could do some things if an API is, is rather open, but most of the other things will not go back. So anything that I'm showing here can be done by anybody and they will not be traced back. It's just you fixing the web for yourself. I call this Cheat Codes for the Web. It's a repository on GitHub and uh, uh, GitHub Pages, and I'm going to do a video about them as well. And I did all these tasks that I'm going to show here right now for people in de de detailed explanations how they can do it. Now, the first thing is the Inspect and Elements tool. Most people, when they start inspecting or opening developer tools, do a right-click and inspect on a certain element on the page. That's great because it's very much in context. It's very easy to understand for any non-technical person as well. It's obvious to the users, but it opens the developer tools without info. Out of a sudden, the elements tool is there and there's the styles thing and there's a console maybe showing and people are going, oh my God, what's happening? And it can also be prevented because it needs a context click on the element so you can stop people from doing right click and inspect. The inspect tool, on the other hand, you cannot prevent. So the inspect tool is this one. You highlight different parts of the page. If you press control, you don't get that little info window that makes it easier to detail click certain things. If you press control and alt, you actually fix the window and you always show that information window about what that element is as well. 
This wasn't there before. We only learned that this is necessary for people that use Zoom uh, viewers, people that need 400% Zoomed interfaces. For them, it was impossible to use the inspect element because this pop-up window was always in the way. So pressing Control now hides it. Pressing Control and Alt fixes it so you can see it again. So this allows you to select anything on the page without the page being able to intercept that and prevent you from doing it. So always start with that inspect tool rather than with a right click and inspect. First thing I, I love to show people is removing overlays. You get these pages where you get a horrible subscription thing. Use the inspect tool, find something that colors the whole page, press a delete and you got rid of it and out of a sudden you can use the page without having that stupid pop-up. We've all done that probably. We've all found other ways to do that. You can remove anything on the page as well by, by navigating through the elements there as well. So you can use arrow up and down and you can press delete to get rid of all the things that you don't want to have in the page but only the one thing that you want to have which is my dog here and then you have a wonderful little page. This is great when printing things out and you don't want to print out all the ads around. For example, Ryanair tickets is something that I keep doing that with because a printer ink is very much like blood or oil and super expensive. So this is something that uh, uh, is easy to kind of understand for people because they, they want to, they, they just delete things. And I had people freaking out like, oh my God, I deleted it from the website. Nobody can access that anymore. No, it's only your copy. <laughs> Elements also allow to take note screenshots. So you can do a right click and do a note screenshot. Oh, uh, create a capture screenshot there. So you can also do, use the inspect tool, go down there, do a right click and go to the dot 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 menu and do only a screenshot of that element. So you don't need to delete all of those, but you can only do an image of that and print that one then as well to get rid of all the crap that you don't want to have. This also, uh, interestingly enough, works with streaming video platforms, which you cannot make screenshots of. If you go to Disney Plus and you try to press print screen or you press like whatever else you do, you get a blank screen because obviously you could uh, take a picture of every frame and then stitch it together to a movie again or something. I don't know. It's a DRM thing, a copyright thing. But using the note screenshot thing, you can also take screenshots of streaming videos and of write protected PDFs, <coughs> I heard. Other things you might see is these buttons that ask you to wait 117, 20 seconds before you can click them. You can edit the HTML and look for a disabled attribute most of the time. And if you just remove that disabled element, the button becomes immediately clickable. So that's something that a lot of these file locker websites and these kind of things do as well. You can actually mess with any HTML you want to. You can change the sizes around, but that actually assumes you kind of know what HTML is about, which is kind of not what everybody else does out there. But it's great to not wait two minutes for a button to be available. Just hit the disable and delete that one. In the bottom part, where normally do you debug your styles, there's also a section called event listeners. And that one shows all the listeners on in that document. Like, what has the developer done to prevent you from doing something? Or how should the website react to you doing something with it? And this one is great to do things like uh, get, get the context menu back. You might have seen these websites where you go and you right click and it says like, oh, this is copyrighted material and the cops are already at your house and don't go for that. You go to the event listeners, you look for an entry that actually says on a context menu, and then you remove that one and you get your right-click menu back. So hiding the right-click menu is adorable, but not secure. It's a great way to actually uh, debug some apps of yours as well if you actually had done that directly. Other things, when you click on them, they go to another site. Uh, you see that probably in a few dodgy websites as well. Just look for a click handler on one of the main elements, HTML body or document, remove that, that click handler, and the redirect doesn't happen anymore either. The network tool is something that is great for debugging your own APIs to look at like network, where data is going, where data is coming in. But it's also a great way to actually uh, browse the media that is on the document or is loaded in the document right now. And I love that tweet by that some person that basically didn't read the instructions of something expensive that they bought the other day. 
where he basically said, like, ooh, what's happening here with the data? How many tracking is going on there? And that random person on the internet basically told him, you can look, you can use the network tab in Chrome. It's this one. And you can see that it's only one time that the API is being called. And then he ends with, like, I have not worked at Twitter. I'm just poking around. And this is exactly what this talk is about. Do that. Mess around with things. Look at the web and make it better that way. For example, you've got these video players that are absolutely atrocious, like have ads popping on them and these kind of things. You can go to the network tool, reload the page, then you see everything that has been loaded, then you can filter by media, and if you see an MP4, right-click, open a new tab, and you get the full video control. So you don't have that every single time an ad pops up when you click on it. You can also right-click and save it. You can right-click and copy as curl and go to the command line and download it that way, which is, of course, illegal and none of you should ever do. But it's a great way to get rid of these horrible video players that are just there to annoy you rather than to watch the video. And uh, the same happens to images. You got, uh, if you go to any website, you open the network tool and you do a reload and you basically filter by image. You get a very easy way to navigate all the images in the document without actually having to click on them and you can copy each of those images, save each of those images and so on and so forth. Device emulation is something that we use for testing our responsive designs, but for end users, it's really interesting what people do with that. And most of the time, it's, pe it's people on, uh, in locations with bad internet connectivity or metered SIM connectivity on their mobile phones. So what they do, like for example, in the past, uh, um, a photo sharing site, something Gram, uh, only allowed you to upload images on a mobile phone. They didn't allow you to upload images from a desktop machine. But using the developer tools and, oh, and using the device mode, you can also upload it from your desktop machine in the office where you have a fat connection and you don't have to actually use up all your data on your mobile phone. So we saw a lot of people using the device emulation to emulate a mobile device to get access to functionality that the web product only allows you to get on your mobile phone because it sends the, uh, it sends the, the, uh, the user agent and it also sends the uh, fake to, to that website that this is a, a mobile phone. You can even set the geolocation in that one as well, so you can pretend to be in another country, but it doesn't work as well as it does a VPN if you want to illegally show. I, I'm, I'm shutting up now. You got, for example, a gallery here. This is a demo gallery that I wrote, that I changed of all the docs that stayed at my house. And it's annoying because you have to click on each of them to see those images. But if you use the mobile uh, emulation right now, and you can see that the interface is different, so you don't need to click on them, you just get the images as one thing. It's amazing how many websites actually are much, much easier to use if you switch to that emulation mode that actually is the mobile version of it. And a lot of times, a lot of like pop-ups and redirects and stupid ads don't show up if you just use that one. So let's, let's go ready for some more deep diving. Uh, the console is the, the best thing there is uh, in the browser tools. It's also one of the most used ones, but it's also one of the most cryptic ones for people who don't know how to program and don't know what the hell is going on there. This is when people say, somebody put the matrix on my computer, please help me. The console has power tools like uh, zero is the currently selected elements, 0, $1, 0, $2 for history, like elements you had before. Dollar and dollar dollar is access page elements. Console table is, is showing the data in a table and you can able to, to filter it as well. And you have a dollar underscore for the result of the last console command and copy for copy to clipboard. But as we're not repeating ourselves, you can watch the video from one of the last half stacks where I had a deep dive on that one. What I've done since then, though, is built this website called Dear Console, and that came from like just Twitter. I was just basically Dear Console, give me that, and I showed people a, a, a command to basically put in their console to get access to certain parts of the document. So I made this as a list, and uh, you can now go there and you can click it, and then it copies the uh, the command on your, uh, into your pa into your paste bin. Go to the console, paste it in there, and get the result back that you want. For example, in this case, the header outline as a text outline. You can filter for different cases, and you can actually just see the code as well before you copy it and paste it. And it's a very simple website that actually got a few people to look at it, and I also got a few people contributing already. 
There's also a quick edit bookmarklet. That's something that I've written for quite a, quite a while ago. You basically can put that into your page, make a bookmarklet, and then you can start editing the page. That is much easier than using the developer tools to highlight bits and delete them. You can just start writing in it. An interesting feature there is as well, as you can see that right now, if I click that, you got the, under, uh, the underline here. So if you actually use that tool, it does a, uh, uh, it, it does a, a check for, for misspellings on the page as well. And under the hood, this script is basically the same as if you go to the uh, go to the console and to say document design mode on and document design mode off. This is actually giving you what you see is what you get on the current website right now. If you have more complex things than the scripts that I showed you here, uh, you can actually use snippets as well. There's a snippet editor in the developer tools that allows you to write JavaScript that run against the current website. Um, this is a great thing to actually do functionality like this one here to show, show all text on every image. Just, I did this for one of our testers. You can do collapse GitHub was something that I, where I didn't want to read all of the things in a, massive, uh, in a massive pull request and so on and so forth. I'm not happy with the implementation of that and I want to make it better. The problem with snippets is like, wouldn't it be great if I could share them with other people on a Dropbox or a OneNote or OneDrive or whatever? But right now, they're actually part of the preferences JSON file of the browser, and they overwrite that file all the time. They used to be in local storage, but that was another performance problem if you got like 5K of, uh, 5 gigabyte of snippets. So they're now really hard to find on your hard drive, and you cannot share them with other people. And I want them to be more shareable, uh, because it would be a very simple way to get people out there. You remember there was extensions like uh, Grease Monkey that allowed you to fix the web, and it would be great to actually fix the developer tools uh, snippets integration there. An interesting thing is that you can run the snippets without going to the editor. You can press Control Shift P in the developer tools, press exclamation mark and the name of the of the snippet that you want to run. So that's how I normally use them in production when I play with the stuff that we have. Another interesting thing is overrides. This is 90% of my life right now. I'm almost pay, uh, I'm almost hosting everything I do on GitHub Pages. And every change that you do then runs the Jekyll engine in the background, generates the HTML from the markdown. And I'm basically looking at this spinning thing in the actions item of GitHub until my page is done. Which is super annoying if I'm only changing CSS or JavaScript and not any markdown to HTML conversion because it's, it, didn't, it didn't change. It doesn't make any sense that I have to wait for it. So for that case, you have overrides. This was too fast. Uh, the override functionality allows you to pick a folder on your hard drive for overrides and allow file access to that one. So that one will become your copy of the web out there. And then you can pick any file in the sources panel or uh, in the page and actually save it for overrides on your hard drive. Meaning you can use, for example, a, uh, um, an ad, uh, an ad uh, script that actually does lots of pop-ups. You can right-click that one and save it to your hard drive. And next time you load that page, it will, it will load that version on your hard drive. It will not load it from the third-party website any longer. So this one allows you to edit a local file instead of the, uh, the third-party file or the one in your own GitHub page right now. And that way you never have to wait for the build process anymore. This was also uh, by the Outlook team because they had like a 10 megabyte JavaScript file that took like half an hour to build every single time and every time they wanted to do a change, they just used the override instead right now to do the fixes there and then they do a diff with the main functionality out there. So this is a great way to really get rid of lots and lots of annoying things on the web by having a, a, a local copy on it. Safari has a really interesting feature that allows you to run a JavaScript before anything else on the page. Not very much documented, but I would love other browsers to implement that one as well. But this is one of the, the best things to basically, uh, uh, to basically fix very annoying websites if you want to save those files locally and delete them or just put like one line of code in there and then none of the crap that actually people want to put in your face comes up any longer. So uh, all in all, I want us to fix an annoying web. Let's tell people about these tricks. Let's tell people that they don't need that super image downloader, Russia, China, whatever XML, but basically they can just use the network tool to find images. And they can right-click them and save them even if the website doesn't allow you to right-click. Let's make developer tools easier to, uh, easier to use and access than potentially predatory and badly performing extensions. And let's turn 
them into web consumer tools as well as expert tools to fix their own products. I think there is so much potential in developer tools, but there are developer tools. They should be maker tools. They should be creator tools. They could be, could be writer tools. The plumbing is there. The UX is not there. The interface is not there. And that's why we need help and I need access and I need more time and more engineers. So please demand more from browser makers. I mean, we put random stuff in browsers that you don't want. But there are things that people keep installing extensions for that browsers could do. And why not have that directly in the browser? These are things I work on. We have public explainers for all of those. I have a, med a media explorer. So that one is basically the network tool, but as a sidebar. So you basically see all the images, all the linked images, all the videos, all the videos linked to it. And you could right click and save them. So that's something that we're considering for researchers, for, uh, for journalists, for people who just want to get access to images on the website. There's a multi-viewport idea where we basically you can render the page not only as a desktop, but as a desktop and a mobile phone next to each other, or several mobile phones next to each other, much like the Sizey browser, or there's a few other browsers out there that do these things as well. Um, we also were considering, but that's gonna be kind of far off, because one of the things that, uh, that people hate about the uh, uh, mobile emulation is that it only does the resizing and it sends the user agent. So it pretends to be an iPhone, but it doesn't render as an iPhone. It still renders as the Edge browser or as a Chromium browser. So we were considering uh, using something like Play uh, uh, Playwright under the, book, under the hood to actually render it in the, other operating, uh, in the other browser engine as well. But that would mean a lot of installations in the background and we still have to see what that means in terms of like performance. Command palette, it brings the command palette that I said, the command shift P into the main browser. So you can control the whole browser with keyboard shortcuts rather than only with the mouse. So that's something we're working on. And the in-browser emulation moves the developer, uh, moves the uh, uh, device emulation into the main browser window rather than having to have the developer tools open at all. So you can just basically see the page as different mobile devices in print mode, in high contrast mode, and all these things without actually having to have the developer tools open. Other websites out there, there's this great one called Can I Dev Tools? Um, and I'm going to mangle his name right now, but I invited the person who actually runs that website who should be here. Yay, he's back there. So basically, he's based in London. This is an Herculean, a, her a massive effort. Uh, he actually looks at all the developer tools of all the browsers, what you can do with them, and actually tells you if you can use that browser to do that task or not that task. So if, you, if you're wondering why something doesn't work in Safari and it works in, in Firefox, you can look it up there. There's also devtoolstip.org, so that's something that I'm writing some, some uh, content for as well, like lots and lots of dev tool tips that you have out there. And that's all I have. So I'm Chris Harman. You can get me at Twitter on CodePoet for now, CodePoet at Toot.cafe on Mastodon. And you can send me an email at gmail at christianheilman.com. And that's all I had. So thanks very much. Thank you, Chris.